Part Two of The Murders in the Rue Morgue by Edgar Allan Poe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part Two. Henri Duval, a neighbor and by trade a silversmith, deposes that he was one of the party who first entered the house, corroborates the testimony of Musat in general. As soon as they forced an entrance, they reclosed the door to keep out the crowd, which collected very fast, notwithstanding the lateness of the hour. The shrill voice, this witness thinks, was that of an Italian, was certain it was not French, could not be sure that it was a man's voice, it might have been a woman's, was not acquainted with the Italian language, could not distinguish the words, but was convinced by the intonation that the speaker was an Italian, knew Madame L. and her daughter, had conversed with both frequently, was sure that the shrill voice was not that of either of the deceased. Odenheimer, restaurateur. This witness volunteered his testimony, not speaking French, was examined through an interpreter, is a native of Amsterdam, was passing the house at the time of the shrieks. They lasted for several minutes, probably ten. They were long and loud, very awful and distressing, was one of those who entered the building, corroborated the previous evidence in every respect but one, was sure that the shrill voice was that of a man, of a Frenchman, could not distinguish the words uttered. They were loud and quick, unequal, spoken apparently in fear as well as in anger. The voice was harsh, not so much shrill as harsh, could not call it a shrill voice. The gruff voice said repeatedly, Sacre, Diable, and once, Mon Dieu. Jules Mignot, banker of the firm of Mignot et Fille, Rue de Lorraine, is the elder Mignot, Madame L'Espagnier has some property, had opened an account with his banking house in the spring of the year, eight years previously, made frequent deposits in small sums, had checked for nothing until the third day before her death, when she took out in person the sum of four thousand francs. The sum was paid in gold, and a clerk went home with the money. William Bird, tailor, deposes that he was one of the party who entered the house, is an Englishman, has lived in Paris two years, was one of the first to ascend the stairs, heard the voices in contention, the gruff voice was that of a Frenchman, could make out several words, but cannot now remember all, heard distinctly Sacre and Mon Dieu, there was a sound at the moment as if of several persons struggling, a scraping and scuffling sound. The shrill voice was very loud, louder than the gruff one, is sure that it was not the voice of an Englishman, appeared to be that of a German, might have been a woman's voice, does not understand German. Four of the above-named witnesses being recalled, deposed that the door of the chamber in which was found the body of Mademoiselle L. was locked on the inside when the party reached it. Everything was perfectly silent, no groans or noises of any kind. Upon forcing the door, no person was seen. The windows, both of the back and front room, were down and firmly fastened from within. A door between the two rooms was closed but not locked. The door leading from the front room into the passage was locked, with the key on the inside. A small room in the front of the house, on the fourth story, at the head of the passage was open, the door being ajar. This room was crowded with old beds, boxes, and so forth. These were carefully removed and searched. There was not an inch of any portion of the house which was not carefully searched. Sweeps were sent up and down the chimneys. The house was a four-story one with garrets, mansards. A trap-door on the roof was nailed down very securely, did not appear to have been opened for years. 
The time elapsing between the hearing of the voices in contention and the breaking open of the room door was variously stated by the witnesses. Some made it as short as three minutes, some as long as five. The door was opened with difficulty. Alfonso Garcio, Undertaker, deposes that he resides in the Rue Morgue, is a native of Spain, was one of the party who entered the house, did not proceed upstairs, is nervous and was apprehensive of the consequences of agitation, heard the voices in contention. The gruff voice was that of a Frenchman, could not distinguish what was said. The shrill voice was that of an Englishman, is sure of this. Does not understand the English language, but judges by the intonation. Alberto Montani, confectioner, deposes that he was among the first to ascend the stairs. Heard the voices in question. The gruff voice was that of a Frenchman. Distinguished several words. The speaker appeared to be expostulating could not make out the words of the shrill voice, spoke quick and unevenly, thinks it the voice of a Russian, corroborates the general testimony, is an Italian, never conversed with a native of Russia. Several witnesses, recalled, here testified that the chimneys of all the rooms on the fourth floor were too narrow to admit the passage of a human being. By sweeps were meant cylindrical sweeping brushes, such as are employed by those who clean chimneys. These brushes were passed up and down every flue in the house. There is no back passage by which anyone could have descended while the party proceeded upstairs. The body of Mademoiselle Lespanet was so firmly wedged in the chimney that it could not be got down until four or five of the party united their strength. Paul Dumas, physician, deposes that he was called to view the bodies about daybreak. They were both lying on the sacking of the bedstead in the chamber where Mademoiselle L. was found. The corpse of the young lady was much bruised and excoriated. The fact that it had been thrust up the chimney would sufficiently account for these appearances. The throat was greatly chafed. There were several deep scratches just below the chin, together with a series of livid spots which were evidently the impressions of fingers. The face was fearfully discolored, and the eyeballs protruded. The tongue had been partially bitten through. A large bruise was discovered upon the pit of the stomach, produced, apparently, by the pressure of a knee. In the opinion of M. Dumas, Mademoiselle Lespanet had been throttled to death by some person or persons unknown. The corpse of the mother was horribly mutilated. All the bones of the right leg and arm were more or less shattered. The left tibia much splintered, as well as all the ribs of the left side. Whole body dreadfully bruised and discolored. It was not possible to say how the injuries had been inflicted. A heavy club of wood, or a broad bar of iron, a chair, or any large, heavy, and obtuse weapon would have produced such results, if wielded by the hands of a very powerful man. No woman could have inflicted the blows with any weapon. The head of the deceased, when seen by witness, was entirely separated from the body, and was also greatly shattered. The throat had evidently been cut with some very sharp instrument, probably a razor. Alexander Etienne, surgeon, was called with M. Dumas to view the bodies, corroborated the testimony and the opinions of M. Dumas. Nothing farther of importance was elicited, although several other persons were examined. A murder so mysterious and so perplexing in all its particulars was never before committed in Paris, if indeed a murder had been committed at all. The police are entirely at fault, an unusual occurrence in affairs of this nature. There is not, however, the shadow of a clue apparent. 
The evening edition of the paper stated that the greatest excitement still continued in the quarter St. Roch, that the premises in question had been carefully researched and fresh examinations of witnesses instituted, but all to no purpose. A postscript, however, mentioned that Adolphe Le Bon had been arrested and imprisoned, although nothing appeared to criminate him, beyond the facts already detailed. Dupin seemed singularly interested in the progress of this affair, at least so I judged from his manner, for he made no comments. It was only after the announcement that Le Bon had been imprisoned that he asked me my opinion respecting the murders. I could merely agree with all Paris in considering them an insoluble mystery. I saw no means by which it would be possible to trace the murderer. We must not judge by the means, said Dupin, by this shell of an examination. The Parisian police, so much extolled for acumen, are cunning, but no more. There is no method in their proceedings beyond the method of the moment. They make a vast parade of measurements, but, not unfrequently, these are so ill-adapted to the objects proposed as to put us in mind of Monsieur Jordan's calling for his robe de chambre, pour mieux entendre la musique. The results attained by them are not unfrequently surprising, but for the most part are brought about by simple diligence and activity. When these qualities are unavailing, their schemes fail. Vidoc, for example, was a good guesser and a persevering man, but without educated thought he erred constantly by the very intensity of his investigations. He impaired his vision by holding the object too close. He might see perhaps one or two points with unusual clearness, but in doing so he necessarily lost sight of the matter as a whole. Thus there is such a thing as being too profound. Truth is not always in a well. In fact, as regards the more important knowledge, I do believe that she is invariably superficial. The depth lies in the valleys where we seek her, and not upon the mountain tops where she is found. The modes and sources of this kind of error are well typified in the contemplation of the heavenly bodies. To look at a star by glances, to view it in a sidelong way, by turning toward it the exterior portions of the retina, more susceptible of feeble impressions of light than the interior, is to behold the star distinctly, is to have the best appreciation of its luster, a luster which grows dim just in proportion as we turn our vision fully upon it. A greater number of rays actually falls upon the eye in the latter case, but in the former there is the more refined capacity for comprehension. By undue profundity we perplex and enfeeble thought, and it is possible to make even Venus herself vanish from the firmament by a scrutiny too sustained, too concentrated, or too direct. As for these murders, let us enter into some examinations for ourselves before we make up an opinion respecting them. An inquiry will afford us amusement. I thought this an odd term, so applied, but said nothing. And besides, Le Bon once rendered me a service for which I am not ungrateful. We will go and see the premises with our own eyes. I know G, the prefect of police, and shall have no difficulty in obtaining the necessary permission. The permission was obtained and we proceeded at once to the Rue Morgue. This is one of those miserable thoroughfares which intervene between the Rue Richelieu and the Rue Saint-Roch. It was late in the afternoon when we reached it, as this quarter is at a great distance from that in which we resided. The house was readily found, for there were still many persons gazing up at the closed shutters, which an objectless curiosity from the opposite side of the way. It was an ordinary Parisian house, with a gateway on one side of which was a glazed watch-box, with a sliding panel in the window, indicating a lodge de concierge, 
Before going in, we walked up the street, turned down an alley, and then again turning, passed in the rear of the building, Dupin, meanwhile, examining the whole neighborhood, as well as the house, with a minuteness of attention for which I could see no possible object. Retracing our steps, we came again to the front of the dwelling, rang, and, having shown our credentials, were admitted by the agents in charge. We went upstairs, into the chamber where the body of Mademoiselle Lespane had been found, and where both the deceased still lay. The disorders of the room had, as usual, been suffered to exist. I saw nothing beyond what had been stated in the Gazette des Tribunaux. Dupin scrutinized everything, not excepting the bodies of the victims. We then went into the other rooms and into the yard, a gendarme accompanying us throughout. The examination occupied us until dark, when we took our departure. On our way home my companion stepped in for a moment at the office of one of the daily papers. I have said that the whims of my friend were manifold, and that je les mejonne, for this phrase there is no English equivalent, it was his humor now to decline all conversation on the subject of the murder until about noon the next day. He then asked me, suddenly, if I had observed anything peculiar at the scene of the atrocity. There was something in his manner of emphasizing the word peculiar which caused me to shudder without knowing why. No, nothing peculiar, I said, nothing more at least than we both saw stated in the paper. The Gazette, he replied, has not entered, I fear, into the unusual horror of the thing but dismiss the idle opinions of this print. It appears to me that this mystery is considered insoluble for the very reasons which should cause it to be regarded as easy of solution, I mean for the outre character of its features. The police are confounded by the seeming absence of motive, not for the murder itself, but for the atrocity of the murder. They are puzzled, too, by the seeming impossibility of reconciling the voices heard in contention with the facts that no one was discovered upstairs but the assassinated Mademoiselle Lespanet, and that there were no means of egress without the notice of the party ascending. The wild disorder of the room, the corpse thrust with the head downward up the chimney, the frightful mutilation of the body of the old lady, these considerations, with those just mentioned, and others which I need not mention, have sufficed to paralyze the powers by putting completely at fault the boasted acumen of the government agents. They have fallen into the gross but common error of confounding the unusual with the abstruse. But it is by these deviations from the plane of the ordinary that reason feels its way, if at all, in its search for the true. In investigations such as we are now pursuing, it should not be so much asked what has occurred as what has occurred that has never occurred before. In fact, the facility with which I shall arrive, or have arrived, at the solution of this mystery is in the direct ratio of its apparent insolubility in the eyes of the police. I stared at the speaker in mute astonishment. I am now awaiting, continued he, looking toward the door of our apartment, I am now awaiting a person who, although perhaps not the perpetrator of these butcheries, must have been in some measure implicated in their perpetration. Of the worst portion of the crimes committed, it is probable that he is innocent. I hope that I am right in this supposition, for upon it I build my expectation of reading the entire riddle. I look for the man here in this room every moment. It is true that he may not arrive, but the probability is that he will. Should he come, it will be necessary to detain him, 
Here are pistols, and we both know how to use them when occasion demands their use. I took the pistols, scarcely knowing what I did or believing what I heard, while Dupin went on, very much as if in a soliloquy. I have already spoken of his abstract manner at such times. His discourse was addressed to myself, but his voice, although by no means loud, had that intonation which is commonly employed in speaking to someone at a great distance. His eyes, vacant in expression, regarded only the wall. That the voices heard in contention, he said, by the party upon the stairs, were not the voices of the women themselves, was fully proved by the evidence. This relieves us of all doubt upon the question whether the old lady could have first destroyed the daughter and afterward have committed suicide. I speak of this point chiefly for the sake of method, for the strength of Madame L'Espanay would have been utterly unequal to the task of thrusting her daughter's corpse up the chimney as it was found, and the nature of the wounds upon her own person entirely preclude the idea of self-destruction. Murder, then, has been committed by some third party, and the voices of this third party were those heard in contention. Let me now advert not to the whole testimony respecting these voices, but to what was peculiar in that testimony. Did you observe anything peculiar about it? I remarked that, while all the witnesses agreed in supposing the gruff voice to be that of a Frenchman, there was much disagreement in regard to the shrill, or, as one individual termed it, the harsh voice. That was the evidence itself, said Dupin. But it was not the peculiarity of the evidence. You have observed nothing distinctive. Yet there was something to be observed. The witnesses, as you remark, agreed about the gruff voice. They were here unanimous. But in regard to the shrill voice, the peculiarity is not that they disagreed, but that while an Italian, an Englishman, a Spaniard, a Hollander, and a Frenchman attempted to describe it, each one spoke of it as that of a foreigner. Each is sure that it was not the voice of one of his own countrymen. Each likens it not to the voice of an individual of any nation with whose language he is conversant, but the converse. The Frenchman supposes it the voice of a Spaniard, and might have distinguished some words had he been acquainted with the Spanish. The Dutchman maintains it to have been that of a Frenchman, but we find it stated that, not understanding French, this witness was examined through an interpreter. The Englishman thinks it the voice of a German, and does not understand German. The Spaniard is sure that it was that of an Englishman, but judges by the intonation altogether, as he has no knowledge of the English. The Italian believes it the voice of a Russian, but has never conversed with a native of Russia. A second Frenchman differs, moreover, with the first, and is positive that the voice was that of an Italian, but not being cognizant of that tongue, is, like the Spaniard, convinced by the intonation. Now, how strangely unusual must that voice have really been, about which such testimony as this could have been elicited, in whose tones even denizens of the five great divisions of Europe could recognize nothing familiar? You will say that it might have been the voice of an Asiatic, of an African. Neither Asiatics nor Africans abound in Paris. But without denying the inference, I will now merely call your attention to three points. The voice is termed by one witness harsh rather than shrill. It is represented by two others to have been quick and unequal. No words, no sounds resembling words were by any witness mentioned as distinguishable. I know not, continued Dupin, what impression I may have made so far upon your own understanding, but I do not hesitate to say that legitimate deductions, even from this portion of the testimony, the portion respecting the gruff and shrill voices, 
are in themselves sufficient to engender a suspicion which should give direction to all further progress in the investigation of the mystery. I said legitimate deductions, but my meaning is not thus fully expressed. I designed to imply that the deductions are the sole proper ones, and that the suspicion arises inevitably from them as the single result. What the suspicion is, however, I will not say just yet. I merely wish you to bear in mind that, with myself, it was sufficiently forcible to give a definite form, a certain tendency to my inquiries in the chamber. Let us now transport ourselves in fancy to this chamber. What shall we first seek here? The means of egress employed by the murderers. It is not too much to say that neither of us believe in preternatural events. Madame and Mademoiselle L'Espanay were not destroyed by spirits. The doers of the deed were material and escaped materially. Then how? Fortunately, there is but one mode of reasoning upon the point, and that mode must lead us to a definite decision. Let us examine, each by each, the possible means of egress. It is clear that the assassins were in the room where Mademoiselle L'Espanay was found, or at least in the room adjoining, when the party ascended the stairs. It is then only from these two apartments that we have to seek issues. The police have laid bare the floors, the ceilings, and the masonry of the walls in every direction. No secret issues could have escaped their vigilance. But, not trusting to their eyes, I examined with my own. There were then no secret issues. Both doors leading from the rooms into the passage were securely locked, with the keys inside. Let us turn to the chimneys. These, although of ordinary width for some eight or ten feet above the hearths, will not admit throughout their extent the body of a large cat. The impossibility of egress, by means already stated, being thus absolute, we are reduced to the windows. Through those of the front room no one could have escaped without notice from the crowd in the street. The murderers must have passed, then, through those of the back room, now brought to this conclusion in so unequivocal a manner as we are, it is not our part as reasoners to reject it on account of apparent impossibilities. It is only left for us to prove that these apparent impossibilities are, in reality, not such. There are two windows in the chamber. One of them is unobstructed by furniture and is wholly visible. The lower portion of the other is hidden from view by the head of the unwieldy bedstead, which is thrust close up against it. The former was found securely fastened from within. It resisted the utmost force of those who endeavored to raise it. A large gimlet hole had been pierced in its frame to the left, and a very stout nail was found fitted therein, nearly to the head. Upon examining the other window a similar nail had been similarly fitted in it, and a vigorous attempt to raise this sash failed also. The police were now entirely satisfied that egress had not been in these directions, and therefore it was thought a matter of supererogation to withdraw the nails and open the windows. My own examination was somewhat more particular and was so for the reason I have just given, because here it was I knew that all apparent impossibilities must be proved to be not such in reality. I proceeded to think thus a posteriori. The murderers did escape from one of these windows. This being so, they could not have refastened the sashes from the inside as they were found fastened. The consideration which put a stop, through its obviousness, to the scrutiny of the police in this quarter. Yet the sashes were fastened. They must then have the power of fastening themselves. There was no escape from this conclusion. I stepped to the unobstructed casement, withdrew the nail with some difficulty, and attempted to raise the sash. 
it resisted all my efforts as I had anticipated. A concealed spring must, I now know, exist, and this corroboration of my idea convinced me that my premises at least were correct, however mysterious still appeared the circumstances attending the nails. A careful search soon brought to light the hidden spring. I pressed it, and, satisfied with the discovery, forbore to upraise the sash. I now replaced the nail and regarded it attentively. A person passing out through this window might have reclosed it, and the spring would have caught, but the nail could not have been replaced. The conclusion was plain, and again narrowed in the field of my investigations. The assassins must have escaped through the other window. Supposing, then, the springs upon each sash to be the same, as was probable, there must be found a difference between the nails, or at least between the modes of their fixture. Getting upon the sacking of the bedstead, I looked over the headboard minutely at the second casement. Passing my hand down behind the board, I readily discovered and pressed the spring, which was, as I had supposed, identical in character with its neighbor. I now looked at the nail. It was as stout as the other, and apparently fitted in the same manner, driven in nearly up to the head. You will say that I was puzzled, but if you think so, you must have misunderstood the nature of the inductions. To use a sporting phrase, I had not been once at fault. The scent had never for an instant been lost. There was no flaw in any link of the chain. I had traced the secret to its ultimate result, and that result was the nail. It had, I say, in every respect, the appearance of its fellow in the other window, but this fact was an absolute nullity, conclusive as it might seem to be, when compared with the consideration that here, at this point, terminated the clue. There must be something wrong, I said, about the nail. I touched it, and the head, with about a quarter of an inch of the shank, came off in my fingers. The rest of the shank was in the gimlet hole where it had been broken off. The fracture was an old one, for its edges were encrusted with rust, and had apparently been accomplished by the blow of a hammer, which had partially embedded, in the top of the bottom sash, the head portion of the nail. I now carefully replaced this head portion in the indentation whence I had taken it, and the resemblance to a perfect nail was complete. The fissure was invisible. Pressing the spring, I gently raised the sash for a few inches. The head went up with it, remaining firm in its bed. I closed the window, and the semblance of the whole nail was again perfect. End of Part 2